Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first Tech in the City webinar of the spring series. Today's guest, Ben Green, will discuss points made about his recent book, The Smart Enough City, Putting Technology in Its Place to Reclaim Our Urban Future. My name is Jerrica Logan, and I am the Outreach Coordinator at the Center for Urban and Regional Analysis, otherwise known as CURA. I will be your host for this event. If you require closed captioning, you will find a box at the bottom of the screen called CC. Click on the box and select show subtitles. This will allow you to see subtitles during the presentation. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the webinar in the Q&A box. We will ask as many of your questions as we can in the last portion of the presentation. And if we do not get to your question, we do apologize. If you have any additional questions following this event, please feel free to email me at logan.433 at osu.edu. This event is approved for one AICP CM credit. To claim your CM credits, log into your My APA account on the APA website and enter in into the event log. There is also going to be a brief survey at the end of the web webinar. If you have time, please provide your feedback. I am now going to pass it over to our director, Harvey Miller. Okay, thanks, Jerrica, and welcome everyone to Kira's webinar series for spring 2023. Uh, this this year, this academic year, we've been following the theme of tech in the city, looking at the upsides and downsides of technology to help us understand and manage an urban planet. And uh, we're very pleased to invite Ben Green today. But I wanted to also, before we get into his talk, I want to talk about our next event in this series. And this will be a, uh, a webinar on February 10th, 2023, same time at noon. And this will be by Jeff Boeing from the University of Southern California. And he will talk about measuring built environments around the world, new insights into urban sustainability and health. So it should be a really exciting talk. He's a real big data guy and looking at global scale comparisons among cities. And I'm looking forward to that myself. But I'm also looking forward to today's talk by Ben Green. Ben Green is currently a postdoctoral scholar in the Michigan Society of Fellows and in the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. He, starting next year, he will be a tenure track assistant professor at the same institution in the School of Information. Congratulations on that, Ben. Uh, he has a PhD in applied mathematics with a secondary field in science, technology, and society from Harvard University. Ben studies the ethics of government algorithm, algorithms with a focus on algorithmic fairness, human algorithmic interactions, and AI regulation. His book, The Smart Enough City, Putting Technology in Its Place to Reclaim Our Urban Future was published in 2019 by MIT Press. And it's a very good book. It certainly resonated with some of my th thinking about smart cities. And I'm looking forward to hearing his comments today. Ben, please. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Harvey, for the introduction and Jerrica for all of your work organizing this event. And thanks everyone for, for coming out. It's great to be able to speak to you all. I have my uh, Jenny's ice cream mug in honor of the occasion. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to talk to you about uh, my book, The Smart Enough City. So I will uh, present uh, some of the core themes from the book and some of the more recent events that have happened since the book was published. Uh, and then, yeah, turn things over to questions. Um, so I think it's you know, also helpful to add a little bit of context of how I came to writing this book. Um, you know, I was, I was working on my PhD in applied math, and I was interested in the role of technology uh, in, in helping to address urban challenges, but encountered a lot of frustration with the types of solutions and ways of thinking about improving society that I was seeing from my department and my colleagues in my field. Um, so I sort of felt like a need to get away from the very tech focused computer science uh, world that I was in. And I left and spent a year working for the city of Boston as a data scientist. And there I was not working on research. I was working on you know, very applied projects trying to uh, really help the city manage data and make better use of data to improve uh, various operations and performance and equity concerns. And so that really led me then 
after that back to research, but uh, to this book specifically really thinking about what is the gap between the ways of thinking about urban challenges that uh, I was encountering in the technology world and then what was actually happening and what was actually needed and working inside the real world environment of uh, city halls, uh, both in Boston, as well as many other places uh, around the country. So, um, so that's really the focus of how I came to this book, thinking about where, what is the proper role for technology in the future of cities. So we can start with a definition of what is a smart city? What are we actually talking about? Um, so this definition uh, that I'll pull is from the company Cisco who writes, by definition, smart cities are those that integrate information communications technology across three or more functional areas. More simply put, a smart city is one that combines traditional infrastructure, roads, buildings, and so on with technology to enrich the lives of its citizens. So there are a couple of elements to this definition that I wanna highlight. The first is that it is really centering the role of technology. Um, and we can see the usage of the word smart here in much the way that we see it across a number of other uh, areas um, from our smartphone to the smart house to a smart toaster or a smart toothbrush where smart means taking some traditional object or process and connecting it in some way to, to and digitizing that thing, uh, connecting it to the internet, adding big data algorithms and so on in the interest of efficiency and convenience. And the second thing to note about this definition is that it is a definition provided by a technology company, not say a city or a mayor or a group of uh, academics. And I think that's useful for framing this conversation because it's important to keep in mind when we're talking about smart cities that this entire realm, this entire term really is one that is uh, heavily influenced by the technology industry. Arguably the term smart city is a marketing term developed by technology companies trying to create markets for uh, new software, new sensors, uh, and new avenues for data collection. And so we wanna keep uh, both of these elements, the centrality of technology and the influence of technology companies uh, front and center when we're thinking about uh, what smart cities are. Um, as that prior definition suggested, the actual uh, technologies of the smart city are somewhat, uh, they're somewhat broad. There's a number of different technologies that we see. This can range from uh, sensors on municipal infrastructure that will collect information about uh, what's going on around the city, weather patterns, traffic patterns, pedestrian counts, and so on. Uh, Self-driving cars or autonomous vehicles are a central facet of, uh, of uh, smart cities. We have uh, various types of big data softwares and algorithms and machine learning systems that are trying to pick out patterns of what's going on in the city and make predictions about what will go on in the future. And then various types of digital connectivity services, most notably 311 apps that provide a way for residents of a city to connect with the uh, municipal staff of that city, say the sanitation department and so on, by providing uh, reports, an easy way to provide reports about issues such as uh, trash that needs pickup or potholes or broken sidewalks and so on. And so within a given city, different versions of these types of technologies, different combinations of these technologies will be uh, brought to bear. And in much of why, my work, I'm specifically focused on the role of machine learning algorithms and some of the uh, political and normative tensions that these algorithms raise, where on the one hand, machine learning algorithms present uh, excitement where many policymakers and engineers are excited about the ability of algorithms to promote more accurate, fair, and consistent decision-making. And this has led to the use of algorithms across a wide range of contexts from uh, the criminal justice system to child welfare services to public health. And yet at the same time, uh, the use of these algorithms has uh, been a site of significant controversy with 
concerns about uh, incorrect predictions, racially biased predictions, and an inability of algorithms to be flexible and to account for the particular context of use. And so thinking about uh, smart cities, then uh, you know, the smart city has emerged as a, and it particularly emerged in the, the early and mid 2010s as a very widespread popular vision for the future of municipal governance. And uh, we can see just a, a sample here of different organizations and companies and uh, government bodies that were interested in exploring smart cities and viewed the smart city as central to its development plan or uh, economic plan. And you know, we had many cities across the United States that were deploying or exploring smart city projects and often using that as a way of branding themselves. Um, I'm not sure if these cities still use these labels, but at one point, uh, Kansas City described itself as the world's most connected smart city. San Diego described itself as having the world's largest smart city platform. And so uh, for many cities around the world, and especially in the United States, the smart city was a way of viewing or, or thinking about and organizing a vision for where are we going in the future uh, how do we want to define what this city will look like as we uh, enter the, the later sort of midpoint of the 21st century? But as we encounter these utopian visions, what we want to do is scratch beneath the surface of what's promised and begin to ask uh, questions such as, are these systems actually possible? Who is behind these systems? Who is driving these narratives? And are these technology solutions actually something that we want to be implemented? And uh, I argue in the, my book that uh, the answer to these questions is generally uh, no, that the smart city uh, presents visions full of false promises and hidden dangers. And uh, we want to, it's necessary to think about, uh, to move away from smart cities and think about an alternative organizing set of principles for what the role of technology should be for improving urban life. So one of the core uh, aspects that I uh, see in rhetoric about smart cities is a particular lens on the world that I call tech goggles, which uh, views every ailment of urban life as a technology problem and selectively diagnoses issues that technology can solve. So looking at the world through tech goggles prompts one to uh, really pull out or see every aspect of the world as a technology problem or to think about the role of technology uh, as the solution to these problems. And it's particularly uh, a viewpoint that is taught within engineering education uh, across computer science and other disciplines and is also uh, you know, disseminated by technology companies as they try to create larger markets for the technology solutions that they provide. And tech goggles rest on two particular myths. The first is that technology uh, drives social change. Uh, and the second is that technology provides neutral and objective solutions to social problems. So the first myth really assumes that we can simply apply technology and whatever the uh, expectations are or the goals are for that technology are what will actually happen in practice and how the uh, how society will actually be affected. And this overlooks the many social factors and institutional complexities that alter and shape the impacts that technology actually has in practice. And the assumption of neutrality overlooks the, uh, the politics of these systems. We have, uh, there's a quote from the IBM president or the former IBM president at this point, uh, describing how if the leaders of smarter city systems do share an ideology, it is this, we believe in a smarter way to get things done. So there's this assumption that simply doing things smart is an apolitical and neutral way to solve urban challenges. Um, and much of what uh, we see when these technologies actually get rolled out is the false promises of these myths and how technology 
does have impacts, but doesn't necessarily have the impacts that are often hoped for or expected. And more importantly, how technology embeds politics and enables certain actors or groups to gain power at the expense of others. So what does it mean to look at the world through technology goggles? Uh, what we see here is a simulation uh, from a group of researchers of what a city street could look like if you got rid of, uh, you, got, you had autonomous vehicles and got rid of traffic lights. And so this is presenting a somewhat utopian vision of how we could get rid of traffic lights, which is, you know, sort of the scourge of every driver in a city. Everyone is frustrated about traffic and congestion. And this, this great simulation of how self-driving cars could uh, sort of weave with, across one another uh, without having to pause because they could uh, you know, communicate across one another wirelessly and manage their driving that way. And on first glance, this looks like a really interesting and novel proposal, but uh, when you think about it a little more, I think you can start to ask some questions about well, what is actually going on on this street? How is, is this even a real city street at all? So what is happening is here is that the tech goggles lens is prompting a starting point of taking a city street and optimizing it into a very simple uh, problem where all that we have to care about is the flow of cars through a given intersection. What's particularly notable about this simulation is that it's actually a simulation of a very specific intersection, not just the generic street, but actually a particular intersection in Boston. One that uh, is not just a home to cars, it's not just at some freeway, you know, high speed interchange, but it is an intersection with, you know, constant uh, pedestrian use. There are many cyclists going through uh, in both directions. You can see uh, the partial bike lane in this image. Um, this is also along one of the busiest bus lanes or bus routes in the city. Um, and then there's, of course, the broader context of uh, sort of where this location is within the city and the social conditions here of how uh, this location is actually at the center of uh, where Boston's opioid epidemic is taking place. And there are many people in this part of the city who are suffering from drug addiction, homelessness, and mental illness. But of course, all of that has been erased. The city, this complex streetscape with many different types of people and many different types of uses has been abstracted into a traffic efficiency problem. And so by doing that, what we've created is a artificial representation of the city where we actually can create these effective technological solutions. The uh, autonomous vehicle solution does seem like it would work. Uh, within the realm of this simulation, but that only seems so neat and easy because we've erased all of these other elements from the picture. And so more broadly then we have a process of distortion where through tech goggles, we're taking a city street and viewing it through the lens of technology. This image on the right here is an image from one of the uh, vision statements put forward <clears throat> by Sidewalk Labs, which is a, a Google affiliated company in its vision for uh, Toronto, which I'll get to and talk about in a little bit. But we can sort of see how uh, this smart city vision is taking a, a streetscape and then rendering it digital as, you know, how do we view a city street as a set of computable objects? <clears throat> And more broadly, uh, there's a sort of interesting through line of history here as this sense of distortion that we see today uh, in some ways echoes back to modes of distortion that were present in 20th century urban visions, such as Le, Cor Le Corbusier's uh, design for Brasilia or the Futurama exhibit by General Motors, where we've shifted the mode of how we're creating a highly regimented order or what type of lens we are focusing on, but the underlying uh, effort of taking a complex uh, city and trying to render it into discrete, highly ordered structure uh, is, is definitely carrying through. So what actually happens with these smart city visions? 
Um, and I'll talk about a couple of different harms that these, that these attempts to create smart cities bring out. The first is how smart cities can reshape urban power and politics. Um, I, uh, so to the extent that the smart city is revolutionizing urban life as it's often promised, it will not be through you know, whiz-bang technological solutions, but by transforming the landscape of politics and who has authority uh, and governance power over the city, uh, city resources and public decision-making. Two particular elements here that are important are surveillance and privatization. So to start with surveillance, much of the smart city rests on data collection and uh, one of the major interests for technology companies in developing smart city uh, tools and software is in the ability to collect data about the city, collect data about people in a new environment. And so almost every smart city uh, project involves new types of data collection. And this is true not just for projects that are explicitly about surveillance, uh, but also even projects that seem to have a more benevolent application often go down the road of becoming tools for surveillance. So in San Diego, several years ago, the city partnered with a major technology company to develop a smart streetlight system where sensors would be embedded into the streetlights to uh, create new data that could improve traffic patterns. But what ended up happening was that not only did this information not get much use for the purpose of traffic, but the data ended up being used as a tool for the police department, um, which is often the case here where police departments are gaining access to data and using it to surveil uh, the public, particularly minorities and protesters and low income uh, communities, even when the tool may have, or the data collection system may have been implemented under a different uh, expectation. And so in San Diego, they were using the, the video camera and the sensors on these streetlights to spy on protests, including some of the protests in uh, 2020 as part of the Black Lives Matter uh, protests that were that were going on following the murder of George Floyd. Um, so surveillance remains uh, a very pressing issue that is really present in all of these implementations. Another key element, uh, another key concern really about smart cities is privatization, where uh, it's not just that the technology is being developed by, by companies, but that technology companies are really attempting to gain more authority over what types of visions are even promoted? Uh, what types of decisions are actually made about public resources and so on? The most notable example of this was the uh, partnership between the city of Toronto and Sidewalk Labs, which is a company of Alphabet, the parent company of Google. And so what they came up with was a plan for Sidewalk Labs to really be in control of the development of a neighborhood on the Toronto waterfront. And so Sidewalk was not just given you know, a contract to develop some technology, but was given a contract really to become the visionary for what this neighborhood should look like, how it should be developed and so on. And it, as the project uh, moved forward, it became clear that Sidewalk's uh, intentions were much grander. They were expecting to expand to a much larger region of the city they made claims even to be granted uh, much of the, the tax income that would be generated from this neighborhood sidewalk labs expecting that they could have access to those resources. And to the extent that they did community outreach, it was relatively superficial, uh, you know, public, public meetings where they would invite people in, but really people were invited to talk about relatively superficial aspects of the program, uh, not making not being able to inform some of the larger decisions about you know, who's even involved in this project, how much data is collected, what is it used for, what are the goals, and so on. Um, and so one of the interesting uh, outcomes there was actually that in Toronto, local organizers were able to uh, develop a, a pretty large gathering of folks who were quite opposed to this project. And in, uh, I think it was May of 2020 or 2021, Sidewalk Labs actually backed out of this project, um, ending it. And so there's a lot that we could say, perhaps we'll talk about it uh, in the Q&A about what this project augurs for the future of smart cities 
uh, and the power as well of public resistance to these projects, which is a really important angle to be capturing here is how is the public responding to these impositions of private control and new surveillance. The other major concern that comes up with smart cities is how it promotes narrow approaches to reforming, to attempting to solve deep structural entrenched problems, uh, where what often happens is that, you know, cities are facing concerns about racist and abusive police departments or the need to develop a, a better public transit system. And then technology companies and technologists swoop in with a promise that their tools can solve these problems and sort of remove the need for more systemic reform. So police departments have adopted various types of algorithms, most notably predictive policing algorithms that uh, attempt to respond to concerns about uh, abusive police departments and racially discriminatory police departments with algorithms that can predict where crime will occur and supposedly take the human uh, bias and discretion out of the decision-making process. And so often what these uh, technologies do is they provide an outlet where a certain amount of reform can be promised, but we've actually, or the agencies and the municipalities are uh, neglecting the need for more systemic reforms to their police departments or to the development and improvement of their public transit system under the expectation that technology provides a relatively straightforward solution. So what is the alternative that we can, that we can hope for here? Um, what I call for is a need to shift towards uh, smart enough cities. And what the shift is really about is moving technology into a more instrumental role in thinking about how do we improve cities, because I, the, the terminology of smart cities presents a very technology focused uh, lens really to become a smart city or a smarter city is centrally about technology. To talk about smart enough cities is to think about how can technology become an instrumental tool? How can we use it? How smart do we actually need to be to improve real world issues around equity, transportation, criminal justice, and so on? And so what this entails is a shift in some of the core principles of how we are actually approaching uh, smart cities. With smart cities, as I've described, we have assumptions of political neutrality. We have assumptions that technology can provide a solution to uh, all of our social problems. And we evaluate these tools based on their technical capacities. Whereas in smart enough cities, we move from an assumption of neutrality to a recognition of the politics of doing this type of work, a practice of technological agnosticism recognizing that whether or not we use technology doesn't have value in and of itself. What we should care about is, is the technology actually beneficial or not? And if it is, let's, that's great, we can use it. But if it's not, we should be perfectly okay stepping away from it. And our evaluations should shift from being focused on the technical capacities of the tools themselves to being really grounded in the real world outcomes that we actually care about. So some of the key principles that this uh, leads to, um, I tried to summarize this down. So three key principles that I think are particularly important uh, for doing this type of work. Number one is to address complex problems rather than solve artificially simple ones. As the example of the, the traffic light simulation showed, it's very easy once we've artificially simplified a problem to uh, create a really neat solution. But in reality, the, the real problems are much more complex. And so we can't be expecting to have, you know, perfect solutions. What we're really looking for is how can we help to address these problems? And how can we do that recognizing all of their complexity? The second uh, principle is to implement technology to address social needs and advance policy. So really thinking about how do we put uh, social and policy goals at the forefront putting technology into more of a, as more of a tool, not the answer itself. And then prioritizing innovative policy and program reforms above innovative technology. 
uh, and really here trying to decouple the link between innovation and technology when thinking about uh, municipal governance. Where we shouldn't be assuming that simply because a reform involves technology that it's innovative. And we shouldn't assume that just because a reform is changing some policy that it's not innovative. We should be sort of decoupling those. So I'll talk about, uh, if we had more time, I would talk about an example from uh, some of my own work in Boston with the Emergency Medical Services Division, um, really using data to improve how that department was actually responding to issues on the street, uh, shifting away from just assuming that the answer needed to be an algorithm or some sort of data-centric solution, but instead using data to help to inform some policy reforms. Um, but I won't go too deep into that for the sake of time, make sure we get to discussion. Another example that is particularly pertinent uh, in this talk is the example of the Smart City Challenge that Columbus uh, went through over the past several years. And this is one that um, I think exemplifies both the promises of these types of principles and also some of the challenges of moving this forward in practice. So the story here is that the Department of Transportation launched a Smart City Challenge in 2015 with a promise of $40 million to create a first of its kind smart transportation system. And the winner of this challenge was Columbus. And I'm sure many of you have encountered this and uh, may know more about this than I do. So, uh, and so you know, definitely interested in talking about more of this in the Q&A as well. But what really struck me about Columbus, uh, the, the plan that won was the novelty of it in terms of really embodying many of these smart enough principles. Unlike many of the other cities, uh, Columbus was not proposing a futuristic plan to end traffic with autonomous vehicles, but was really focusing on the connection between transportation mobility and social mobility, and more importantly, building on work the city had already been doing, uh, where this already working towards how, how to shift towards more dense development, mixed use development rather than sprawl, and how to uh, improve conditions for low income neighborhoods with high infant mortality where healthcare is often inaccessible. And so the goal and the novelty of this, this proposal was to really integrate technology into those plans that were already in place. Um, and then further, as the, as the team uh, worked on this project, they didn't just jump immediately to technological solutions even for those problems, but actually went out and talked to the community to better understand their challenges and needs, moving away from simplistic tech solutions towards other types of approaches that integrate technology reforms with other types of policy and programs that ranged from promoting better Wi-Fi in, in low-income communities, um, providing childcare for uh, these communities for, so, or for mothers to access jobs and healthcare appointments, on-demand rides for pregnant mothers, and so on. And so what, what really struck me here is how the best way to avoid the simplistic and solutionist mindset fostered by tech goggles is to really learn what barriers and challenges people actually face um, and to integrate communities as much as possible into that visioning process and that scoping process. But as, uh, as many of you may be familiar with, the implementation of this program uh, was really hard and faced a number of significant barriers that point to the, the gap and the tension between the revolutionary tech-centric rhetoric of smart cities and the reality of how to make technology useful in practice. Uh, some of the retrospective reports suggested that much of the initial technology uh, proposals that was planned didn't end up getting as much use as was hoped for, and the focus on marginalized communities was difficult to maintain in the face of flashier projects that also attracted uh, private investment. The, when Columbus won this proposal, there was a flood of uh, new interest and new proposals from technology companies that may have overwhelmed some of, the, some of the planning as one of the individuals who led Smart Columbus and the Smart City Vision uh, described in, a, in an article, uh, it's not supposed to be a competition for who has more sensors or anything like that. And I think we got a little distracted at a certain point. 
And so there certainly was some movement on some of the more justice and equity oriented projects, improving, including a, a pilot program to help pregnant women uh, get on demand rides to medical appointments, um, and, as well as uh, access to you know, shopping and other things that they would need to do, access grocery stores and so on. But I think what we can see here, uh, or what I take away from this is both, you know, there was a lot of really exciting uh, thoughtfulness and a, 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 that embodies much of what I think of as a smart enough city vision here. Um, but then also actually the, the road from a great vision to implementation is really difficult. And the pressures of the label of the smart city, which inflates expectations and the, uh, the flashiness of the projects that will get more attention and particularly attract a lot of uh, proposals and engagement from the private sector often detract and distract from uh, some of these from some of these uh, goals that really should remain front and center and really require the most uh, the most development and the most active work to move forward because they are so hard and require getting across all of these barriers. So happy to dig more into this uh, in the q and I think there'll be a lot more to unpack here. Um, but to uh, talk about the last two principles, number four is to ensure that technologies design and implementation promote democratic values. Number five is to develop capacities and processes for using data within municipal departments. So a few quick examples of what I mean by these. Uh, one of the major developments in smart cities over the last few years, and even really since I was working on the book, has been more and more public backlash and public interest in uh, creating better regulation for these technologies, not just allowing them to be used or embracing them wholeheartedly, but putting in checks so that uh, there would be public control over how this technology was used and really what technology would be allowed in the first place. Uh, the ACLU has been a major player in developing what's known as surveillance oversight ordinances through its CCOPS program, uh, community control over police surveillance. Uh, and that, that those have passed in many different cities and others, some of these cities as well, have also placed bans on police use of facial recognition technology. And then for city infrastructure, um, you know, I think one of the major things that all of the rhetoric on smart cities completely misses is how the essential importance of basic data infrastructure and capacity. It's very easy to talk about, you know, the, the, the new city operating system and big data solutions and sensors all over the place. But what really actually matters is basic uh, as, a, as a ground level for doing any work in cities is having the capacity through data management and access, as well as actual staff within cities who are know how to work with data and know how to uh, use data in to solve novel types of problems. One really interesting project that I write about is in New York City, they developed a practice of data drill. So if you think about the fire drill from when you were a kid in school, this is like a fire drill for how do we use data in an emergency. And so the city would gather a bunch of different leaders together and say something like, you know, there's a blackout across Brooklyn and we need to uh, figure out who to, you know, where to send the emergency vehicles, who we should help first. And they practice, you know, we don't have an explicit data set that just tells us exactly what the answer is. Instead, we need to look across different data sets. We need to bring together the information that we have that may be quite disparate across many different departments, bring in the expertise of agency leaders, as well as workers on the ground, uh, firefighters, EMTs, and so on. And so they would do these practice exercises so that they would be able in an emergency uh, or, and just more generally for day-to-day -day projects to be able to, uh, you know, solve novel types of problems for which it wasn't simple to just say, here's our data set, here's our answer, because uh, that's how many real projects actually go. And in doing that, they've built up much more capacity to move towards data science projects and analytics projects. But at the foundation of that, 
is data management and uh, staff capacity to work with data. So just to wrap up, um, you know, I think that I see the, the, the path towards smart cities as being at an interesting crossroads. I won't dig into each of these different areas, but we've seen both significant pushback of smart city projects, uh, as well as, you know, efforts at governance um, and efforts at regulation. And I think really a central question now is where do, where do we go? Where are the smart city teams going? Where does a team like Smart Columbus go from here? And then more broadly, where do smart enough city visions go from here? What is the sustainable role of technology in cities and city governance? Now that we've moved past some of that first phase of overhype and rejection of that, um, where do we go next? So that's that's a really central question that I think about a lot and informs a lot of my work specifically with algorithms. Um, and I think there's a lot for, for all of us to discuss there. So I'm going to wrap up there. Thank you all so much. And I look forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Green. That was a very thought provoking uh presentation. And I want to encourage people in the audience to please submit your uh, questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to them in just a few minutes. I think I'll start mm -hmm. off with a couple of questions, taking my prerogative as Senate Great. Director. And yeah, so one thing I want to, ta I want to talk about is uh, you, you touched upon Smart Columbus, and I appreciate that kind of nuanced um, view of it that you kind of mm -hmm. resonates with my experience with Smart Columbus. One of the things about Smart Columbus was that we, we it was a public-private partnership. And you mm. know, we talk about the Columbus way here in, in Columbus, the way we have this unique collaboration among businesses and community and, and um, government and, and academia. Um, does tech, do, do, does this smart city tech approach, does that kind of upset the, the delicate balance of that type of collaborative approach? Or is there something fundamentally wrong in these, or te a fundamental tension in these public-private partnerships? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, technology really shifts the, the bounds or the dynamics within those partnerships. I think it can really, you know, it, it, it's quite natural to, for the technologists in those partnerships and the technology companies to be able to have more leverage because they're the ones who, get, who at least seemingly get to define, well, here's what's possible, here's what we can do, here's what's on the table. Um, and I think that, you know, it can be very hard for uh, the non-technologists in those spaces to recognize what's real, recognize what's not. I mean, if you think about self-driving cars, pretty much at any point over the 2010s, people were saying, you know, the self-driving car is going to be ubiquitous five years from now. Well, we're well past that five-year window and it's not at all true. And maybe the people at those companies believed that maybe they were just saying that as a, as a matter of hype, I won't try to you know, parse that out, but what the, what the companies are promising is often not real or not, not actually valid, but it can be very difficult for uh, you know, organizations, city staff uh, to, to, to really critique those and recognize uh, sort of pull the center of gravity away from the tech centricness of it. And I think it becomes especially easy for the broader community to be left out of that conversation when you're thinking about technology at the start. It sort of feels like, well, the technologist will tell us, here's what we can do, here's what's available, and then we'll go from there, rather than starting somewhere else that's grounded in, you know, what do we want to accomplish in our city? What are our goals? And then, you know, we'll see if there's any interesting role for technology within that. Um, but subordinating the tech focus. So I think that, you know, I think these dynamics are probably true across many different areas, but I do think technology just shifts the balance a little bit. Okay, good. Um, I want to ask, you know, I'm glad you showed that autonomous vehicle tra traffic simulation. I use that mm -hmm. in some of my talks and lectures oh, as well, because it is a very good example of abstract, <laughs> creating a simple problem for a more complex problem. But I know if I remember correctly, that's from MIT Media Lab. So that came out of uh, science and that came out of academia. So I, I wanna ask about, you know, you talk about tech goggles. Um, mm -hmm. Where does that come from? I mean, for, for the 
the last century of urban science, we've been talking about these grand models and talking about how to optimize cities and how to make cities more efficient. You know, is, is some of the some of the fault here with are, are there are, are there science goggles? I guess is what I'm saying that where the tech goggles come from, and what do we do in academia as educators and researchers to kind of get beyond these uh, these science goggles in which we approach cities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I mean this is this is a huge question. I mean the history of it, I I I can't totally pull out, but I think it is really. I mean, I think it's it's worth looking both at the the pedagogy side and the industry side. Uh, I mean, in pedagogy, yeah, I mean, computer science, for instance, it's very much the way that we're taught to just focus on models to describe how technology can solve all of the problems. I mean, engineering is very much a discipline that teaches its its students to solve all problems with technology. There's very little practice of humility, recognition of limits, and so on. Um, and then, of course, the technology industry, you know, wants us to view the world through that way, through that lens, because that, you know, makes it easier for them. Then suddenly the products that they uh, will provide, you know, some big data solution appears like a more natural way of dealing with things. But, you know, this is not a view that is, uh, you know, unique to even modern technology. One of the interesting things, and I briefly touched on some of the those earlier 20th century visions. I mean, in, uh, you know, Le Corbusier writes about how, you know, being up in the air on a plane provides a new lens on cities. And you can sort of see that how it led to this very, uh, so a, a type of urban design that would have a very neat organized top-down structure if literally viewed from a plane, but obviously had lots of problems when that was actually developed in practice. So I think there's always, on some level, you know, some hype around science or technology as providing a way to solve social problems. Because as we, you know, within the natural sciences, it is so nice to be able to, you know, look within a particular lens and you can come up with these solutions. And I think it's just very, it, it feels very natural to then want to say, well, why can't we do this for social problems? Why can't we move that into the, the sociological or the political realm? Um, and, and I think that's a real, a real issue. I mean, in terms of pedagogy, one of the real shifts that, that I think is important is really grounding our assumptions about what makes a good technology, say a good algorithm, be grounded in real world impacts. Um, I think it's so easy for technology, you know, in computer science, you learn how to develop an algorithm and you evaluate that algorithm based on its you know, formal technical characteristics. And so computer scientists will then go to cities and say, you know, you should develop this uh, algorithm that will provide advice to a welfare agent. And here's all of its great properties, but they've never tested what it actually does in practice. They've never tested, well, how does the human collaborate with this algorithm? How does it actually affect decision-making in practice? They just assume that they can sort of take formal evaluations and those will work in practice. So I think grounding the uh, practice and sort of forcing students to work on more real world cases and recognize that what makes it good, if you're developing an algorithm to improve child welfare, what makes it effective is not that it makes accurate predictions, but that it actually Im improves child welfare decisions. And there's often a very large gap between a good model that makes good predictions and a model that will actually improve the decision-making process in practice. And so, I think grappling with that provides a way to a way into starting to to move away from this lens where you know you're forced to confront the gap between the simplicity of the tech goggles view and the complexity of the real world. Right. Very good. Um, I want to ask one more question. And then I'm going to turn it over to Jerrica Logan, who's going to field some of the audience questions. But okay. one of the things you hear about, you know, smart cities and really these uh, public-private partnerships and bringing tech firms and other firms into into um, into into our governance and how we op how we run cities, is we hear you know that government is very slow and hard to innovate. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we have tech companies that basically can can try things and see what works and what doesn't work. Um, I want to talk about a bit about that tension, or just ask about that tension between the Silicon Valley view, which is to move fast and break things, versus the need for us to be, um, you know, 
you know, safekeeping our responsibility to the community. Just recently here in Columbus, we had a Tesla go into the side of our convention center and caused uh, $600,000 worth of damage. And we were very, very lucky there weren't lots of people killed. And, you know, we, we know that Tesla is notorious for shipping buggy driving software and then collecting data on our city street. So, mm -hmm. I mean, one argument we could make in, is that, well, you know, um, you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet. So maybe we should allow some of these things to occur. Um, what do you think about a utilitarian argument that somebody might push back and say, well, these things are going to happen, but eventually things will work out better? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a very big assumption to say, well, eventually things will work out better, right? Um, I think, you know, Tesla is a great example where, yeah, we're always promised these, these cars, uh, whether Tesla or other companies will be ubiquitous and will be driving everywhere and everyone, no one will own a car anymore and everyone will just, you know, ride share on autonomous Ubers, things like that. Um, you know, the, those, those projects are very far away from being possible. And I think one of the, the issues is, I think even through a utilitarian lens, you could start to say, well, we don't actually know that this will be safer or, you know, the point in time when this will be safer is so far down the road, we shouldn't stop doing other things because of it. I mean, a number of cities were disinvesting in their bus systems and saying, well, we're just going to start doing a public private partnership where we pay Uber to, uh, you know, to provide rides. Um, you know, we can obviously could talk more about the labor conditions of, you know, some of these companies and how they operate, but, uh, you know, I think it was also like we're now actually in a moment right now where these companies are not doing well. You know, Google and Microsoft and Amazon are not are doing mass layoffs. They're not hiring at will. And, you know, what one thing that uh, folks in cities would often say when I would talk to them about some of these issues, they're like, you know, a city can't fail like a city or I mean, it can, but it's like a, the stakes of a city failing or going bankrupt are much higher. You know, we think of it's easy to see a company as uh, persistent, but you know, a sit, many of these companies, you know, Uber is losing tons of money, right? Like it's not actually a sustainable company. And so we need to be mindful of the, there is a real commitment to a long-term trajectory or long-term sustainability that cities need to, need to have. And I also think that type of, uh, you know, assumption, I think discounts the ability of governments to innovate, again, in ways that aren't just about technology. I mean, certainly, I think there are ways to improve that and make cities more able to uh, try out new types of pilots around programs and services and all of that. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I don't think that there's sort of, a, you know, I think we should resist a, a binary of, you know, the technology industry is providing productive innovation. And if you're in a city, all you're doing is, you know, boring stagnation. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Jerrica now, who's going to field some questions from the audience. So we have our first one here. Um, what are your thoughts about community members contributing to the smartness, um, being additional sensors, helping with the interpretation of the analysis or of the of the data, um, and they're uh, able to access with the data streams? Um, so, what would a community member's role be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I uh, we sort of think about community members' role in a couple of different ways. I mean, I sort of push against the, uh, you know, the idea that, okay, smartness just means, you know, getting more community members involved in becoming smart or sort of being smart citizens. Because I think as we center these, even if we try to do these pivots, we're still centering an idea of smartness as technology that you know, we can have, uh, you know, that we're, yeah, we're assuming that the technology is the answer and well, maybe we bring more of the community into that. Um, and, you know, I think there maybe are, are some partnerships where that, that becomes possible, but there are a lot of challenges too. Um, you know, one of the uh, things that, uh, you know, one of the realms where this comes up is around 311 apps, which is a way of really trying to leverage the public as, uh, sensors that are collecting data about the city. But there are a couple of challenges that come up with that data actually in practice. Um, so in Boston, we worked on uh, analyzing some of this data and for, for sidewalk 
uh, complaints. And what we found were two issues. One, the number of complaints that were coming in about sidewalks on the 311 app were uh, far too many for the city to actually deal with. It was kind of an overwhelming amount. The distribution was quite heavily biased. And this is often what happens when you uh, you know, hope to rely on the public to provide this type of information. Uh, there's far more input coming from uh, well-off neighborhoods, primarily white neighborhoods, and far less input coming from the lower income and more minority neighborhoods. Um, but then also we found that the data was actually not super reliable, that the, the reports of where the city needed to be going and repairing uh, sidewalks did not align at all with some of the more uh, the other types of assessments that the city had done at a more you know, global level on that. So we found that actually, you know, although this approach has a lot of theoretical promise in practice, it's, it can be very misleading and can sort of create a strategy where, or create a, a, an outcome where you don't really have any thoughtful strategy of you know, how you're balancing the priority of streets based on their location, their neighborhood, equity concerns, and so on. Um, and so for me, I, I'm more, I'm really interested in the role of community members in shaping these projects more broadly. You know, I mean, one of the more, one of the most interesting sets of developments in smart cities has been driven by communities in Toronto and San Diego and Seattle and other places organizing together and demanding that they have more control uh, and say in what types of projects are pursued, how technology is used and so on. And I think that in a way more than anything has uh, shifted a lot of the expectations and next steps around where smart cities go. Um, but unfortunately those, those visions all had to be, or those, those efforts all had to be a matter of resistance, you know, uh, being able, having to, revolt essentially, or maybe that's a little strong, but object to having been excluded and being so upset about facial recognition plans or sidewalk labs taking over a neighborhood that you push back. And I think the real question is how do we ensure that these processes are inclusive and democratic from the, smart, from the start? Uh, and that's really the role that I wanna see for community members here. Thank you. Um, I think we have a couple more minutes left. so. Um, we'll get to have one more. Um, the next one is going to be, um, thank you for your uh, presenting. What are your thoughts on public ownership of these smart tools? Um, yeah, um, I think there's, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that generally I, I am interested in how to increase public control over these tools. And I think public ownership is a model that could be quite interesting. One of the, there's a partnership in, uh, you know, one of the interesting types of, of smart city programs that, that I contrast is between, so in New York, there was an effort to develop sensors uh, with a Link NYC program that was developed. Uh, again, Sidewalk Labs comes up again, uh, very involved in that. Chicago had a program that uh, for, sensors for uh, environmental conditions and so on. That was a joint project between uh, Argonne National Lab and NSF and, uh, and other, other uh, organizations in the city of Chicago and so on. And so that really was a combination of you know, municipal ownership and sort of the scientific community of the NSF and so on. Um, and I think in that program, what we were, what, what was able to see was because there wasn't as much incentive for the program being grounded by, you know, advertising and data collection about the public, there was much more ability to a focus on important questions around environmental equity and so on, and also to actually engage the community in a much more inclusive way around privacy, to be able to actually take data minimization steps and so on, because there was the goals were more about, uh, you know community acceptance and community benefit. And so, you know, there are obviously a lot of challenges around, I think the real challenge here is around investment, right? How do we make sure that if we are gonna move more in that direction of public control, that there are sufficient funding and resources to actually push forward on these projects. And that's often where there's a sense of, well, the only way forward is to work with private companies. So I think there are, you know, deep questions here 
Um, and sort of a lot of what we could characterize as dynamics of the smart city are dynamics of austerity, where cities are operating and trying to make the best of what they can under a situation where they're very low resource. And that provides the leverage for technology companies to come in and say, you know, we have a solution to spread your staff a little bit further because you're so limited, or we'll provide you a free trial of all of our facial recognition sensors if you just let us deploy them and we'll provide you some insights. So I think the, the resource issues, uh, again, are something that really shift that balance, really disempower municipalities from being able to take considerations like equity and privacy into account as they pursue these projects. Okay, I think we're at the top of the hour now, so I'll have to call it um, an end. But uh, thank you very much for the thought-provoking talk and the uh, and the and the answers to our questions. And um, people in the audience, please uh, keep in touch with Kira. Go to kira.osu.edu. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. I think we're also looking at Mastodon right now. Uh, but but you can. There's many ways to keep in touch with us to hear more about our events and activities, including on February 10th, when we'll have uh, Jeff Boeing show us some amazing things he's doing on, an urban, on a global scale with comparing cities with big data. So take care, have a good weekend and um, be well. Thank, Thank you, you all very much, really appreciate it.